Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Your daily encouragement that God has the world in the hollow of his hand. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Good morning. It's hour two of Mornings with Carmen. Here's the statement of the day. People are complicated. People are complicated. I don't know if you've noticed that. Maybe you've noticed it about yourself. You could think of people like an onion. Mm -hmm. There are lots of layers. There are lots of layers. What what else is layered that we could use? Because maybe an onion you think of as um, as not not so wonderful. In my house, Um, everything good starts with an onion. Like I'm a savory chef. And so an onion to be described as an onion would be a huge compliment (laughs) in the world I inhabit. Um, But maybe the many layered thing that you would like to think of, ooh, maybe it is, what's that, um, what's that lollipop? You know, how many licks does it take to get to the middle? Oh, it's a Tootsie Pop, isn't it? Okay. So maybe, you know, people are like a Tootsie Pop. Right? It takes a lot. There's a, just a lot of layers and some of them. You just you just can't wait to get there. Can't wait to get to, you know, what's on the 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 core of the person. So, um Rosalind Carter is an, you know, is an onion or a uh, or a Tootsie Pop depending on how you want to think about it, right? So, um we've heard her described as a steel magnolia. There are lots of things we know about this woman's life. And I'm talking about her this morning because she's complicated. And I think that we honor people when we recognize just how complicated um, they are. And and I think complicated is okay. I think that it's um. I think it's okay to recognize and acknowledge that there are things about an individual that we can lift up, we can absolutely love and respect. There are things that we can learn from them, and yet there are points at which we could deeply disagree with another person and their worldview and the way that they. Um, uh, the way that they advocated for particular things. So um, I want to lift up the beautiful, beautiful 77-year marriage of Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. That's what I want to lift up as this, like, gem or jewel that we can all um, admire. They, um, they were the only love the other ever knew. Just think about that for a moment. In terms of, in terms of, Marital affection. Um, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter were the only the only experience the other ever had. They are, you know, that other person, that person with whom they became one flesh is the only love they ever knew. Um, that's really incredible. Um, and when Rosalind died at the age of 96, peacefully at her home in Georgia on Sunday, um, Jimmy Carter um said in a statement, Rosalind was my equal partner in everything I ever accomplished. She gave me wise guidance and encouragement when I needed it most. As long as Rosalind was in the world, I always knew somebody loved and supported me. That is, um, that is a beautiful keeping of vows in sickness and in health, um, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, till death do us part. Rosalind Carter was um, by her husband's side when he was inaugurated as our nation's 39th president in 1977. She was, by his own description, a rock of support um, during challenging times like the hostage-taking crisis at the U.S. Embassy in Iran. Um, She was by his side during what had to have been a crushing night when he lost to Ronald Reagan in a landslide election, made him... Um, a one-term president. But they um, had been together a long time by then. (laughs) They were an old married couple by the time, even as a young couple, they um, served as the president and first lady of the United States. So you heard Nick Pitts earlier in the first hour um, tell us the story of um, Jimmy Carter as a toddler 
going to see with his mom, who was the nurse who had delivered the new baby down the street. Um, So Jimmy Carter, as a toddler, seeing the newest baby on the street, and that was baby Rosalind. Rosalind says she turned Jimmy down the first time that he proposed because she had promised her father on his deathbed that she would finish college before she wed. And so she honored her father, um, and then she honored Jimmy with accepting his proposal. She talked about life with Jimmy Carter as an adventure um, and reflected on their life together um, as literally, they both said this of each other, it's the best thing that I ever did. It's the best thing that I ever did. Jimmy Carter um, said it was more important to him than winning the Nobel Prize. He said it has been the pinnacle of my life that I was able to marry Rosalind. I want you to think about that. Um, so they um, their story was highlighted in a 2020 book um, called What Makes a Marriage Last, and they were interviewed. And... Um, she she told this story about saying to her mom, I don't know a single boy that I thought I would ever want to spend my life with until Jimmy Carter came calling. Um, so they were married in 1946. So they've been married 77 years before death did them part. Um, you know part of their story. Um, there are probably parts of their story that you will hear unfolded in the coming days. Um, but But know this. The president described her as his secret weapon. He frequently asked her to sit in on cabinet meetings and even in, on, in some uh, national security briefings. He credited her as being his confidant um, during very challenging times. Um, they together um, founded Habitat for Humanity in 1976 um, alongside Mildred and Linda Fuller. Um, with the stated mission of seeking to put God's love into action by building homes for people in need. Um, They are also um, advocates for mental health and mental health access. They wanted people to have decent homes and good care. Um, Jimmy Carter told ABC News in 2021, every single day we simply have grown deeper in our love for one another over all these years. Um, He also revealed this in an interview. If he and his wife argued, and he said, yeah, we argue like most couples, but we decided long ago never to go to bed angry with each other. Quote, every night we make sure that we are completely reconciled from all the arguments during the day when we go to bed. He added to one interviewer, for the day will come when one of us will not wake up. And we want there to be no regrets. This is a couple who um, held marriage in honor. And so in all of the ways and in all of the things that you might say or hear said about Rosalind Carter, let's be sure that we recognize that they held honor in marriage among us all in a day and time when marriage is dishonored by so many. Our friend Jeff Barrows is going to join us next from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. We're going to actually um, continue a conversation that we've been having, um, and this is uh, about not just what it means to be pro-life at the beginning of life, but what does it mean to be pro-life throughout life and even to the end of life? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Dr. Jeff Barrows is here with us. I'm from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Carmen. Happy Thanksgiving week. Happy Thanksgiving week. I mean, I'm not even going to ask you what we should and shouldn't eat on Thanksgiving because I don't want to be guilted in advance. (laughs) You know, it's okay every every now and then to have a a celebration. Nothing wrong with that. That that doesn't hurt. In fact, I'll be celebrating myself in many ways uh, with far too many calories and probably far too many sweets. So, it's so not a yeah, problem. no, like the average. I mean, I mean, the average calorie caloric intake on Thanksgiving is something crazy, like forty five hundred calories. And let me just go ahead and say, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm. I'm probably going to reserve most of my calories that day for the big meal, right, and for a piece of pie afterwards. But I don't know how people are packing forty five hundred calories in. Like that seems like uh, anyway. I, we can leave this conversation there on the table, but. Um, that seems like a lot. That seems like an obscene amount. 
it, it's over a pound. Uh, I think 36, 3,700 calories is one pound. So if you're looking wow. at 45, that's over a pound. So it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, let's talk about um, the conversation that you and I had teed up for today. Follow up on the AMA's decision to um, to continue uh, opposing the Christian Medical and Dental Association's position on assisted suicide. So tell us what's going on here. Well, as your regular listeners uh, will uh, maybe remember, when we talked a few weeks ago, I mentioned an upcoming meeting of the House of Delegates of the American Medical Association. And there were two resolutions that were coming before the House of Delegates that we were very concerned about, and both having to do with the issue of physician-assisted suicide. One resolution was going to change the official terminology of the AMA from using physician-assisted suicide to what I think is a gross misnomer, uh, and they were going to change it to medical aid in dying. And that was the first resolution. The second resolution was even more concerning because it was to change the official stance of the AMA regarding physician-assisted suicide from opposed, which is where it is now, to being neutral. And I just want to give credit to uh, several of our members, members of uh, other like-minded organizations like the Catholic Medical uh, Association. Uh, we had several residents and students who went to this meeting in person to testify against both of these resolutions. And I'm very happy to say that they were able to uh, vote them down, both of them. Uh, the first one, again, to change the terminology to MAID was even though the resolution was voted down, they did decide to refer that to the AMA's Board of Trustee for further study. But the second resolution to move the AMA from an opposed to a neutral stance was completely voted down in large measure because of the in-person testimony of so many people that were opposed to that. So we're extremely thankful. I just want to give credit where credit is due to those that, that made the effort to travel to Washington, D.C. for this meeting. And so it'll help us in the future as we fight assisted suicide coming into various states across the country to be able to continue to say that the AMA is opposed to this and they have not adopted a neutral stance. I want to um, spend some time in just a moment, Jeff, unpacking um, the largely ignored outcomes of loneliness. So there's been a longitudinal study that I want you to um, to talk with us about. And I'd like to tee that conversation up with a couple of personal stories from um my own prayer list. So, you know, a friend, like these are two different friends of friends. So Harold is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He's 61 years old. He um, is a single man. He suffered a stroke at home um, and was on the floor for four hours before someone discovered him. So obviously he um, has some significant paralysis on one side of his body. He is... Mm -hmm despairing. I don't have any other way of describing that because he's 61 and he's now, you know, going to live out the rest of what may be a very long life in a in a very sad nursing home. Um, Stephen is a divorced dad. Um, he has a son who's a senior in high school. Um, Stephen is recently diagnosed, well, I guess six months ago with ALS. And so his caregiving senior in high school son is helping his dad now at the stage where um, it's getting, he can no longer speak and it's becoming difficult to swallow. So you know the timeline there. Um, these men have differing social networks. They are both believers in Jesus. Um, loneliness and being alone at an age and stage when we need help is a reality. And it's a growing reality in America. So when we come back from a very brief break, can you can you help us unpack the largely ignored outcomes of being lonely at the age and stage of life when we need help the most? Certainly we'll try. Yeah. We're talking with Dr. Jeff Barrows from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. 
I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word APP to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. Hey, our friend Jeff Barrows is uh, here today from the Christian Medical and Dental Association, cmda.org. Jeff, there has been a longitudinal study of... um, loneliness in later life and the relationship of loneliness to what we'll call religiosity. So tell us what this study has has revealed. Well, as you mentioned, Carmen, in your examples before the break, uh, getting older is never fun. It uh, it's, uh, can be very difficult. In fact, I lost my mother-in-law to ALS. Uh, she mm. uh, was fortunate enough to have uh, five children and uh, two daughters, one of which is my wife, who took care of her the last two years. But not all people are, are that fortunate. And it really also goes back to what you were saying about the Carters and, and having a lifelong partner in marriage. It's just so critical. But not everybody is blessed that way. So this was a study that was done out of Baylor looking at how uh, religiosity, and they measured it in terms of regular attendance at a religious service, Christian or non-Christian, as well as participation. And they used national data, which is available to uh, any researcher, and they looked at the years 2005, 2006, and then also 2010 and 11. And, you know, the results are not surprising for those of us who are Christians and regularly attend church. They found that regular, consistent attendance at a formal religious event was associated with lower levels of loneliness. And again, that it's really kind of common sense. And they also found that the older you were, the more uh, likely you were going to see a difference, especially with adults 65 and older. They also tried to examine how uh, people integrated their their faith into their life, and that's more difficult to quantify. So they weren't as successful in discerning a clear pattern there uh, between uh, religious or faith integration and loneliness. But the takeaways for us as Christians is, again, you know, when, when we get older, we have a loss of spouse and loss of close friends. We may have our own health issues. We have family moving away. So loneliness is going to generally increase as we get older. So uh, you want to be involved with a community, especially a faith community that brings somebody into regular contact with others who are in similar circumstances, especially those that view the world the same way we do as Christians through the, the lens of a gracious creator, God and Savior. So We should acknowledge that God is often also behind the ability to to us to make these friend connections within churches or other communities. So I know that many of your listeners may have recently lost maybe even a spouse or close friend. And so there's this initial temptation to isolate yourself because it's so painful because people want to ask about how you're doing and it brings back the memory. But I would just say to them, don't wait too long. Uh, Re-engage, especially with the faith community that can help you find the fellowship that you were created for and the role that God has for you. So uh, I think some some good news this Thanksgiving week. I'm going to encourage us, each and every one, to seek out someone who is living alone. I just, I just put it that way. Somebody who's living alone. Um, maybe it doesn't really matter what age and stage of life they're at, but obviously older adults are in view right here. Um, The United Kingdom has gone so far as to name a loneliness minister seeking to tackle the sad reality of modern life. That's a quote. Um, The state of New York um, has appointed Dr. Ruth Westheimer um, to be the the country's first loneliness ambassador um, in a state. I guess I'm wondering um, why churches aren't on the leading edge of this. Maybe your church has a 
uh, deacon to the lonely. Maybe you have a whole committee. Maybe you have an effort that's churchwide to be sure that on this Thanksgiving, no one who lives alone um, is going to be alone. Um, maybe there is an effort underway like that that is more organized than just a local church. If so, I need to know about it. I'd like to know about it. So you can text me, 877-933-2484. I'd like to know that the church is pressing in on this front, that we are being the family of faith to one another. Um, I'm good with, uh, you know, man whom statistics here. I know a man whom. That'd be fine. 877-933-2484. What's working? How is it working? Who's leading it? How can we fan the flame and um, and stir the pot on this particular um, effort? There, it's a it's a crisis. I don't know how else to say that, Jeff. But like, this is a this is a health issue. This is a welfare and concern issue. This is a body issue for the body of Christ. Like, people are genuinely not just alone; they're lonely. And you're exactly right. I think the church should be leading the way. If if you're involved in a church community and the Lord has blessed you with good health and, and good friends, you know, just one tremendous way to have uh, the ability to reach out to somebody, it doesn't have to be a whole group of people, one or two that are homebound or not able to get out and are lonely. Uh, what a tremendous ministry that is. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. Um, so Paul Perot, if you remember, the 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 woman that we had on who their family really not only befriended, but really wove the other woman into their family. And then along the way, she began to suffer dementia. And then the book is really about that dementia journey with their single friend. Yeah, anyway, I can't remember. I'm, yeah, I I'm know what you're blank. talking about. Give me a few I'm moments. I'm blank. I've yeah, like, give I, me a few so moments. So that's a, that's a good uh, good, uh, good note that I shouldn't just randomly bring stuff up that I didn't put in my notes. But that's what came to mind because they reached out to this single woman in their, um, in their congregation. Um, she, uh, you know, she'd been a school teacher. They, you know, they had known her as a part of, of their church. And they realized, like, you know, she's she's literally alone in the world. And she, we got a space at our table. And so they started just inviting her to stuff that they were doing. And eventually she fully became a part of their family. Um, and then that gave her someone to walk with in the last years of her life when um, when no one else would have recognized her. They still knew her. They remembered who she was. They knew the stories. They could do you see what I'm saying? Like, she wasn't alone in even as this world began to fade away. Um, and I think that's important. I think it's essential. I think we got to be the body in that way. I think the Lord also really honors that. I mean, if you look at the Old Testament and the vulnerable, uh, this is what who the Lord is really concerned about. And I think he honors and blesses people who do reach out and, and look around to the needs of others around them, especially those that are more vulnerable and, as you're saying, those that are lonely. All right. The author is Karen Martin, and the book is Memorable Loss. So thank you, Paul Perot, for that fast research. Really appreciate that. Jeff, um, happy Thanksgiving week. Um, happy beginning of Advent, because uh, we won't talk with you until after the beginning of Advent. So uh, we will look forward with you to uh, to this wonderful holiday season. So I'll ask you the two required Thanksgiving questions. First, what is your favorite side item? Like, it wouldn't be Thanksgiving if there wasn't what on the buffet? Um, sweet potato casserole. Mm -hmm. That seems to be really, really high on the list. And then um, pie, of the pie options, which pie option are you choosing? Well, if it's available, and I won't know if it'll be available, but I love <laughs> pecan pie. So I really do have a sweet tooth. Uh, I have to admit it, but I love pecan pie. So oh, if it's so out there, good. I'll go I'll go past the pumpkin and go right to the pecan pie. I, I feel like the pecan pie and the sweet potato um, casserole are poten potentially like related. I feel <laughs> I feel like those have like a similar a similar palette of flavors. A lot of sweetness to it. Maybe maybe mm, that's part mm -hmm. of it. A little nutty, little nutty, a lot of brown sugar. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh. You are um, you are getting us all revved up. OK, I love it. Yeah. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. You as well now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, so a question um, earlier from somebody on the text line um, recommending that I 
go do my grocery shopping, which I confess to you that I hadn't finished up yet, uh, you know, saying, you know, you got to go as early as possible. Okay, here's the deal. Sweet Matthew um, is actually working a shift after school today. Uh, And so, you know, he's going to make sure that all of those grocery carts make their way back from the parking lot, um, you know, to the to the buggy corral so that you can grab one quickly on your way in the door. And then he's also bagging groceries. So because Matthew is going to be there for the, you know, after school slash last minute Thanksgiving shoppers um, uh, event today, I will be doing my grocery shopping during that window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you can pray for me and you can pray for Matthew and everybody else who's going to be working at grocery stores across America um, today and tomorrow as well. So um, maybe you have noticed, maybe you haven't noticed, Christmas is coming. Mm -hmm. Some people already have their decorations up. It's not quite around the corner, but it's not far off. And that means that Advent is actually close at hand. So Advent begins four Sundays before Christmas. So if you look at the calendar, that means this year Advent actually begins on Sunday, December the 3rd, because Christmas falls on a Monday, which means that the last Sunday in Advent and Christmas Eve are going to be the same day, I think. I don't know. My math is so bad. Um, It's time to prepare either way. It's time to prepare to prepare. Prepare to prepare. So to help us get ready for Advent, we're talking today with Amy or Ewing about the distinctive voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus. We ask ourselves when we hear the song, Mary, did you know? What did you know? When did you know it? Well, we know by listening with earnest attention to Mary's voice. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Well, we are headed into that season when we are all looking for ways to focus in on Christmas time and Advent. Amy Orr Ewing is joining us. She's the author of Mary's Voice, Advent Reflections to Contemplate the Coming of Christ. Amy, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to join you. So Mary is obviously a central character um, in the birth narrative of Jesus, like we can't have Christmas without Mary. Um, Talk with us about what drew you into, um, you know, focusing not just on Mary, but specifically on Mary's voice. Oh, thank you, Carmen. Yes. Um, Well, I've grown up in an evangelical context um, and have known the Lord for three decades, and I've been a theologian and speaker and you know, um, reading the Bible a lot over many, many years. I've never really thought about Mary other than sort of, I guess, imagining her in quite a sort of static pose, you know, blue dress, cherubic baby on her hip, a, a kind of silent figure. And I think possibly because, you know, we think, well, maybe the Catholics major a bit too much on Mary, so we we don't think about her at all. I once played Mary in a nativity play at my school as a child, and for the whole hour-long production, I didn't say a single word. You know, Mm. Mary is a kind of mute figure for us. But I realized that um, that that's not right. You know, when you look at the gospel accounts, you see that for Luke, Mary was his, one of his primary eyewitness sources for the entire gospel. And in Luke chapter one, we have her direct responses to the incarnation, that encounter with Gabriel, and then actually her direct speech. And that makes the New Testament unlike any document of the era to record the words of a first century woman. I mean, it's just stunning. So um, as I began on that journey, I then began to realize that through looking through that lens of her perspective, there's this amazing theological richness because her whole life and all her words point us to Jesus. It's not really about her, but through looking at her, through her perspective, we gain this richer sense of who Jesus is. Mary not only speaks, she asks questions. Um, we we yeah. have a record of her sense of feelings, the actions that she took. Um, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think that this is the first time that I have really been drawn into um, thinking about, not just that she pondered these things in her heart, I think I've considered that before, but that this is a woman who 
exercised a choice. She reflected. She responded. She spoke up. She demonstrated great faith. Um, so I would love for you to to center to invite us in. Maybe that would be the thing to do here. Yeah. Invite us in again to Advent, to the Christmas story, um, accentuating this particular perspective, this one woman's voice. Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Carmen. Mary, in in all of her encounters, is not this static mute figure. She's engaged. She's richly drenched in in the Old Testament. She quotes from Hannah's prayer from Psalm 107 in her Magnificat. You know, I I first really began to consider Mary's perspective um, a few years ago, just two or three years ago. Now, I was supporting a woman um, in a criminal trial. She'd uh, been abused as a child. She'd gone to the police. Um, The police had taken the case. She was now an adult and the trial was happening. And I was there to support her in the public witness gallery. And after um, a couple of days of of hearing the trial unfold, I, I really felt just so in so much lament and sorrow and darkness really just wanted to pray and I went into one of the cathedrals the big beautiful old churches we have in England still and um, I just sat there wanting to pray and as I did a service of Evensong began and the choir got up to sing and they were singing this beautiful choral music and it happened to be Mary's Magnificat and there was this one line in the Magnificat that they sang in Old English, it says, he hath brought the rulers down from their thrones and he hath regarded them of low degree. And it it hit me between the eyes that Mary's vision of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come into this world to do, to tackle the powers of darkness, to proclaim that there is a coming judgment and that he will be judge of all, it, 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 just was stunning to me in in that situation and you know in advent that's the season um the the four weeks before christmas when christians think about the first arrival of god in history jesus you know the incarnation and we think about the second coming the fact that jesus is going to return and we reflect on our our own place between those two arrivings and sometimes we're in lament sometimes we're in you know really difficult seasons of struggle and prayer and crying out to to him and um, as we do that to recenter Mary's perspective and her voice what she actually said what she actually believed about Jesus is is really powerful and really encouraging and so yeah that's my prayer in the book you know it's a daily devotional through December um, and it's just bringing us closer to who Jesus is through that central perspective of of Mary we're talking with theologian Amy or Ewing. The book is Mary's Voice, Advent Reflections to Contemplate the Coming of Christ. So many um, demands on all of us, particularly women mm-hmm. during this season. I think there is a real challenge for each of us and all of us to center ourselves on Christ mm-hmm. at Christmas time. There are a lot of competing expectations and demands on our time, our attention, our resources, um, the same would have been true for Mary. Like, right, the um, the centering on Christ in in the entire experience. I mean, she had a lot of competing demands in her life as well, but she really, um, she centers her life on him. And that, yeah. too, is, is a real gift in all of this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I don't know about you, but in the run up to Christmas, there's just so much to do, isn't there? So much emotional labor, so much um, planning and party organizing and gift buying and sorting out relatives and who can sit next to who. And um, (laughs) yeah, yeah, we, we, we can feel really burdened with all of those material aspects of the holiday season. But by setting aside some time each day to reflect on on you know the advent story on the reality of god actually coming in human history on who jesus is and who we are in the light of that you know we can 
we can center ourselves on Jesus. And Mary's voice is, is a way of doing that. It's a way of um, welcoming him through recentering the voice, actually, of Christianity's most significant female witness. And as you say, she had um, a lot to deal with. You know, she was a woman living in a time where a woman's voice meant nothing. You know, a woman, uh, her, her testimony in a court of law in the first century was not valid. It had to be a man's voice, a man's testimony. She was living at a time when um, her people were living under the occupation of a foreign power. You know, she lived under the Roman Empire, one of the most powerful empires the world has ever known. She lived at a time of relative poverty, if you compare the resources ordinary people had then to, to what we have now. And so, you know, she she can help us with with what it actually means to, to center who Christ is and what he's come to do and what it means to live with hope in this kind of dark world and in this dark age. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Um, you you know the story, but have you actually listened to the story through the voice of Mary? We're talking with theologian Amy or Ewing about her gift to us this Christmas season. It's called Mary's Voice, Advent Reflections to Contemplate the Coming of Christ. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Thanks for listening to the podcast of Mornings with Carmen. As you know, this is a rebroadcast of the live radio show carried on the Faith Radio Network. There's a lot going on at Faith Radio Tons of free resources just waiting for you and for you to share with others at MyFaithRadio.com. How does that all happen? Well, it happens through listener support. So Faith Radio, Mornings with Carmen, all available because of listener support from listeners, well, just like you. If you're a supporter, thank you so very much. If you'd like to become a supporter today, just visit MyFaithRadio.com. And again, thanks for being a part of what we do every day at Mornings with Carmen. Continuing our conversation with Amy Orr Ewing, she's the author, among other things, of Mary's Voice, Advent Reflections to Contemplate the Coming of Christ. Amy, we um, we all know, you know, like the seven words, the seven statements of Jesus from the cross. I wonder how many folks, uh, if we just ask them, hey, what what are the things that Mary actually said? How many of us could rattle those off? You are inviting us into that exercise this Advent to really listen to the voice of Mary. So maybe we could unpack one of those. What is something that Mary says um, that stands out in your mind right now? Yeah, so um, in her interaction with the angel Gabriel when he arrives and says, Mary, you're highly favored. You know, just Mm. think about that for a moment. She's a woman in a patriarchal context where a woman's voice meant nothing. She's living under occupation. And God says through the angel Gabriel, you are favored. And um, he says, you're going to have this child. He will be Emmanuel. He'll be the most high. He'll reign on David's throne. His kingdom will never end. And the text says she was troubled and afraid. And she said, how can this be since I'm a virgin? That's the first question she asks. In other words, Mary is a real person living at a real time of difficulty and struggle, living under occupation, and she understood human biology. You know, she knew where babies Mm -hmm. came from, and she exercises her voice to question, how can this be? You know, and she's, she's troubled. She knew what it would mean with all of those um, layers of already disadvantage she's living under to now be pregnant and unmarried. And the angel speaks to her of what, what, what it will be and what it will mean. And then she says this, she says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as your word has been said to me. In other words, she says, yes, may it be so. She chooses to accept that awesome responsibility and offer, perhaps knowing the prophecy and that had been given to her people through the prophet Isaiah that one day a virgin will conceive and have a son and he will be called Emmanuel, Isaiah 7 verse 14. Perhaps knowing the words to all of our foremother Eve, the first messianic promise of the Bible that 
a woman's seed will crush or bruise the serpent's head that one day someone born of a woman will have the power to utterly defeat evil. I mean, that must have been pretty overwhelming for a teenage girl, you know, just, just an ordinary teenage girl who does understand biology, who's just met an angel, but she says, may it be to me according to your word. So she says yes to God. I mean, what outstanding faith. There's so much um, respect for the human person in this passage. Like, right, God yeah. God has a will. He has a chosen person. Um, he, yeah. sends, he sends word to that person that this is their very unique calling in all of human history. Um, yeah. But then she gets to agree, like, it's not like yeah, God's going to do this to you no matter what, right? She Exactly, the, the, yeah. You the only say, reason it, it feels like Luke tells us that she says yes is because there was the possibility she could have said no. Exactly. Like in our words, you could say she exercises consent. I mean, yes. it's very, very clear in the conversation. She's given um, the word. She's given the opportunity. She is afraid. She does understand biology. She does understand the cultural cost of what she's being called to do. Mm -hmm. You know that song, Mary, did you know? The answer mm -hmm. is yes, mm -hmm. she did know. Mm -hmm. And Amen. she says, may it be according to your word. So she stands in that stream and that flow of scripture, all of the prophecies of the Old Testament, and, and she's willing. She says yes. She has, um, in, you know, in her own voice when she says, I am the Lord's servant. I just think of so many people today who struggle with the question of identity. You know, who am I? Mm -hmm. You know, what in the world am I in the world to do? That identity, belonging, and purpose thing. Um, Mary is very clear um, in understanding who she is, and she articulates it beautifully in laying claim to the reality that I am the Lord's servant. I am... I am yeah. his vessel. I am his handmaiden. I am, you know, I guess whatever the language might be that we would attach to that. Um, but she has a clear sense of who she is. And now in this moment, she knows what in the world she's in the world to do. It's pretty great. Yeah. And then in her Magnificat, in the um, the statement of, of praise that just flows out of her, um, after that encounter with the angel Gabriel, she invites us into that vision of, of who God is and what Jesus has come into this world to do. So I mentioned earlier, he will bring the mighty, the rulers down from their thrones and exalt them of low degree. It talk, she talks about the hungry will be filled with good things and the rich sent away. The proud will be scattered in the imaginations, in the machinations, in the thoughts of their hearts. And so there's this extraordinary defiant statement of theological hope that the coming of God in history in the person of Jesus actually changes things. It, 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 it turns the power structures of our age on their head. It turns things upside down. Jesus coming into this world really matters. And for those of us who you know, who struggle in this dark and weary world. You know, we can live in the light of the hope of what the coming of Jesus actually means, that there will one day be justice, that there is peace, that there is a kingdom beyond, you know, just the political system we live in. And we can lift our eyes with hope to, in this season of all seasons, to, to see that and live in the light of that truth again. Uh, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful um, invitation into a relationship with Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, that I, I, I don't know that anyone else has ever done. At least not uh, to put it in our hands as a um, as an experience for Advent. So thank you so much. It's such a gift. Amy or Thanks. Ewing is the author. Mary's voice is the devotional. Advent Reflections to Contemplate the Coming of Christ. Amy, thank you so much for joining us and for the gift of this book. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Mary said, after her encounter with the angel, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. 
surely for now, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear God from generation to generation. God has shown strength with his arm. God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of God's mercy, according to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. That is the song of Mary. That is the voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer recognized the uh, submissive and maybe subversive nature of Mary's song. In a sermon during Advent in 1933, consider that, in a sermon during Advent in Germany in 1933, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the song of Mary is the oldest of Advent hymns. It is at once the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary Advent hymn ever sung. This is not the gentle, tender, dreamy Mary we sometimes see in paintings. This song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, or even playful tones of some of our Christmas carols. Nay, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, listen to the voice of Mary. Mary's um, soul magnifies the Lord. Her spirit rejoices in God as her Savior. Consider that. Consider what Mary obviously understood and knew as Jesus was conceived. Consider how Mary articulates how God is looking with favor on the lowliness of her and others. Consider how much she understood about all that was to come to pass when she said, surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. Mary understood that God's mercy was not just for her, but through her from generation to generation. Mary, did you know? (laughs) Yeah, you betcha. And maybe more importantly, God knew Mary. God knows you as well. So as you sing or hear the songs of Advent, can you sing with Mary, the Magnificant? Can you sing to God hymns of praise for all you know about who he is and what he has done? What he has done for you, how he beholds you as his very own. Whatever the circumstance of your life, whatever you're going through, wherever you are today, God sees you, God knows you, and God loves you. Let's walk our faith out into the world that God so loves with the kind of faith that Mary had in the God who comes. Have a great day and God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.